stand up with me, if you will. Let's, let's have a word of prayer. We'll pray, then we'll go into the scriptures. Amen? Pray with me. Father God, Just we just want to praise you, John. We just want to bless you, Lord. We just want to thank you. We just claim that your presence, that your spirit is here. We claim that your holy angels are here. We claim that your people are here with the, with the desire to receive from you. And Father God, right now, we just say that uh, you are welcome. You are in charge. This is your church. We are your people. And Father God, we can't do anything without you. So Father God, anoint me to speak and anoint the hearers to hear. And let the word that is spoken be your word. Let it not be from my intellect or from my mindset, but let it be from your throne room. And Father God, if a word is spoken, then you're going to watch over your word to make sure it does not return unto you void. Father God, but it's going to bring forth 30, 60, and 100 fold. So we claim that the hearts and minds of your people are receptive to receive. And Father God, you're going to squarely plant in their hearts. Father God, we bind everything that's not of you. We bind every hindrance, everything that's trying to, to, to suggest, everything that's trying to distract, we bind it all in the name of Jesus. And Father, we loose all of heaven, all of the hosts, all of your presence, all of your glory. Father God, have your way right now. Move with power and with authority. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand of praise. We're going to go into the book of, well, just, I don't really want to read all the scriptures we read last week. I just want to maybe highlight uh, just Luke uh, 10, 17 through 20. Luke 10, 17 through 20. We'll highlight that. Okay? Luke 10, 17 through 20. Once you get to say, praise the Lord. Y'all Y'all ready? Y'all ready? All right, okay. But you got to be ready for what you're ready for. I can't tell you what you're ready for. You re Y'all ready? Yeah. Amen, amen. Luke 10, 17 through 20. Once you get to say, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Once you get to say, preach, preacher. Preach, preacher. Amen. With the help of the Lord, that's what I plan on doing. I'm just going to read one version. It says, when the 72 followers came back from their trip, they were very happy. They said, Lord, even the demons obeyed us when we use your name. Jesus said to them, I saw Satan falling like lightning from the sky. He is the enemy, but know that I have given you more power than he has. I have given you power to crush his snakes and scorpions under your feet. Nothing will hurt you. And verse 20 says, yes, even the spirits obey you. And you can be happy, not because you have this power but because your names are written in heaven. Amen. 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 That's, that's a shouting word right there, y'all. Amen. Amen. Then, I, then, I, then I, I, I entitled the subject, Rejoice in What Matters. Amen. And we went, we went into it a little bit, but the word rejoice means to be glad. Amen. And, and if we're going to constantly think about our salvation, we should constantly be glad. Amen. Amen? Amen? If we keep our focus and keep our mindset and keep our thought processes, no matter what, on our salvation, we'll be glad. I know it's cold in here, but y'all got to warm up a little bit. <laughs> if you and I aren't worried about moment to moment, Situation to situation. If we're not worried about the highs and the lows, if we're not worried about how we feel, if we just focus on our salvation, we will always be glad. We're going to preach that word today, amen? And I want to give you a scripture. It's 2 Corinthians 4, 17 and 18. Okay? That's where we're going to go today. 2 Corinthians 4, verses 17 and 18. Once you get it, say, I got it. I got it. All right. Only this section got it. Need, this section, y'all need to catch on up. 
2 Corinthians 4, 17 and 18. All right, they got it over here too now. I'm going to read three different versions. It says, for our light affliction. Y'all hear that light? Okay. Which is but for a moment is working for, for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Y'all got it? While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Whoo, that was good, huh? Another one says, for our light momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes on not what is seen, but what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Come on, y'all. The last version says, for our momentary light affliction is producing for us an absolutely incomparable eternal weight, eternal weight of glory. So we do not focus on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is, y'all tell me the word, eternal. Amen? Y'all got that? Now, I want y'all to hold on to that, and I'm going to give you another scripture, too. You don't have to go to this one. It's Ephesians 6, 17. It says, and take the helmet of salvation. Another verse says, put on, the, or put on salvation as your helmet. Amen? You guys got that? Say, I got it. Now, if you pray with me, I'm going to build a story, and we're gonna, it's going to make sense once it's all said and done. Amen? Look at your neighbor and say, are you rejoicing? Look at your neighbor and say, are you glad? Look at your neighbor and say, are you saved? And tell your neighbor and say, if you're saved, then you need to rejoice in what matters. If you're saved, you need to rejoice in what matters. Put your hand on your heart and say, I will. Rejoice, Rejoice in, what in what matters. Amen. Amen. You may be seated, praising God. Amen. Now, I, I just, I just want to cut to the chase. I, I, just don't, I don't want to take a whole lot of time, and I don't want to, I don't want to uh, belabor too many things, but I want to get to the truth and, and stay in the truth about some things. Uh, we, we, we get mixed up too much in the church. We, we, we lose focus too much in the church. And we let too many things occupy our minds and occupy our time and, and take away from us too much in the church. See, because we're constantly fighting battles that don't matter. We're constantly fighting against things that have no consequence and things that don't matter. If you, if you win it today, you lose it tomorrow, it, it, it doesn't matter. And see, the thing about it is we're supposed to rest in a battle that's already been won. We as a church are supposed to be resting in the victory that Jesus Christ secured at the cross. And then when he went down into Sheol into Hades and resurrected, we're supposed to, as a church, rest in that. But we're supposed to, as the, as the, as the body of Christ, we're supposed to just rest in salvation. You guys get that? We're not supposed to be fighting with every single thing that comes along. We're not supposed to be blown, like the word says, be blown by every wind of doctrine. We're not supposed to be unstable. We're not supposed to be shaken because something in life happens. What did the word say? The word said, for these light afflictions, right? It said these light afflictions, which are but for a moment, are working for us. So when the battles come, the battles are working for us. Everything in the life of a Christian is somehow, some way, working good. <laughs> Have you ever, as a parent, spanked your child? Hey, hey, y'all, y'all, y'all got that when y'all woke up. Yeah, I sure have. Hey, y'all too proud of that. 
But, but, but think about why you spanked your child. You didn't spank your child for the moment. You spanked your child for their life. You wanted to stop a behavior now that was going to hurt them later. You wanted to stop them while you had your eyes on them now instead of when you don't have your eyes on them later. You wanted to stop them from acting certain ways and developing certain habits that were going to cost them later on. So, so, so you telling me that that spanking was not for a purpose. It was. When things come into our life, these light afflictions, we want to start crying all the time. We do, church. I thought I was saved. You are? I thought saved folk didn't have any problems. Please. Saved folks seem to have more problems right now. Come on, y'all. I'm, I'm trying to preach. Help me out. Y'all need to pray for me. If you ain't going to look at me, pray for me. But saved people endure things too. But it says this temporary light affliction is working for me. These things that I'm going through, they're working for me because I should not be focusing on the here that I'm getting spanked right now. I should be getting focused on the reason why I'm getting spanked now so I'm ready for the later on. And when the spanking comes, it's not for the moment, it's for the eternal. So God said don't focus on the right here and the right now. It's working something greater because if you don't get a spanking now, you can't get the blessing later. If you don't get it right now, you don't get the goodness later. What this is doing, what the affliction is doing, is preparing you for the blessings. And we want to keep saying, the devil is after me. The devil is trying to get me. What did the word say? The word said that he gave us more power than the devil has. So how can the devil be after you? It's not the devil. Hello. It's not Satan. It's not Lucifer. I don't know who you call him. It's not the guy with the pitchfork and the red suit on. The church gives the devil too much play when he's already defeated. Every time you want to say the devil, man, shut it down and get a new vocabulary and say God is somehow working it out. God is somehow doing something. God is somehow using this. This affliction, the word said it's light. Oh no, how am I gonna make it? It's light. I can't do it. It's light. God, if you don't rescue me right now, it's light. And it's working for you. So why are you praying against it? <laughs> Hello. I'm going to talk to myself for a minute. Now, Tony knows if Tony didn't get them butt whoopings when Tony was little. It was a lot of them. Q was right. I got whooped. Me and Tracy got whooped the most. I got whooped a lot. But see, my mom, if I look back, my mom never abused me. She did. As a matter of fact, she gave me breaks sometimes. My dad never would whoop me. My dad would never whoop me. I think my dad felt sorry for me. But he sure couldn't stop mama from getting me. Dad, you never stopped her from getting me, man. Now that I think about it, I got so many whoopings and daddy was just there. But oh well, we, thank you, Lord. That was my light affliction. That was correcting me. That was getting me right. That was getting me ready. That was getting me in position. That was getting me in tune. That was working things out for me so that I could develop the right habits for what life was going to bring me. I would never look at my mom while she was spanking me and say, she's the devil. Y'all hear what I'm talking about? So why, since you who are saved 
and your steps are ordered by God and all things work out together for the good of those who love God, for those who are called according to his purpose. Why, when you're over here in your affliction, you want to say the devil or God is being bad to you? You have to think that this affliction is light. It's just for a moment, but it's working out something greater for me. I'm saved, so therefore I'm victorious. I'm more than a conqueror. This stuff is not a bad thing. It's working something good for me. I just got to stand pat and know that God has me. But the church keeps messing it up. Perfection is not on this earth. We need to get that together. Perfection doesn't exist on this earth. This earth is still, no matter what, a fallen place. All right? And the reason why we want perfection is because we come from a perfect God. That's why the contention is there. And that affliction is there to keep us right. Amen? So then, we talked last week a little bit about, about how they were happy that they had the authority and the power over the demons. And how they used the name of Jesus and overcame even the demons. And the Lord corrected them real quick and said, that's great, that's wonderful. Yes. But I already know that the devil's defeated. So you're not fighting against him. Come on. <laughs> oh, come on, y'all. He, he said, I already know the devil's defeated, so you're not fighting against the devil. You know how much time the church wastes even talking about the devil? And this is the most I'm going to talk about the devil ever that you'll hear me. Because I want us to all kind of shut it down. I want us to get perspective. If you are a child of God, ask Job what the devil can do. The devil can only do what God allows him to do. There's no more that the devil can do. Right? So he said, don't, don't be happy about that. That's the way it is. He said, rejoice. Be glad that you're saved. Because if you're saved and you know that you're saved, you get to undo all the works of the enemy. But this is what I want to focus on today. Put on the helmet of salvation. I want to talk to your head. I want to speak to your head. Because this is where the Christians just keep on losing it. In your own head. <laughs> in your own mind. In your own thoughts. In your own intellect. A Christian forgets to put on the helmet of salvation. A helmet is designed to place over your head, right? The Roman soldiers would go into battle and they put all the, the warfare, um, the, the, uh, the armor, right? And I don't want to focus on any of the other armor. But they would put it all on. And the last, guess what the last thing they put on? The helmet. Helmet was made out of brass, out of copper, out of some hard metal, and then it had leather. And it said that they would decorate their helmets. You know what I mean? They had distinctive helmets. Like, you know, the hockey goalie, how they have their distinctive helmets, right? Their, their design. So they would put that on last. Boom. That means that they were ready. That they were ready to go into battle. The Christians of today keep this war going on in their minds. And the reason why the war keeps going on, the reason why you have your ups and downs in your Christian walk, the reason why you even doubt if you're saved or if you're not saved, the reason why you don't know if it's right or if it's not right is because your mind. Because we quit putting on the helmet of salvation. When we put on a helmet, a helmet is for protection. Football, you can't play without a helmet, right? You still might get some concussions, but you can't play without a helmet. Race car drivers put on a helmet. The cyclists on the road put on a helmet. The motorcycle riders put on a helmet. They put it on for safety. Now what are you putting on a helmet for safety for? To protect what's inside of the helmet. 
We as, come on, y'all, I'm preaching already. When we as Christians put on a helmet of salvation, God is saying that we're supposed to govern our thoughts. We're supposed to govern our minds. We're supposed to protect what's in there. We're supposed to protect because salvation is right here. Salvation is not in your toe. It's not in your hand. Salvation is right here. Salvation is right here. When you're saved or when you're not saved, it's a matter of your mindset. It starts right here. The battles are right here and it ends right here. It's in your mind. So every time we go into a battle and we think anything and start saying something that's all contrary to the word of God, we're losing the battle because we're not protecting our minds. We're supposed to put on a helmet of salvation and protect what's under that helmet. Our human brains call all the shots in our body. Right now I'm breathing because my brain told my lungs to inhale and exhale. My heart is pumping right now because my brain told it to do so. My kidneys are functioning, my liver is functioning, my spleen, everything I have is functioning because my brain is telling it to do so. And since it's telling it to do so, I'm alive. If you and I are saved, folk, and we have our helmet of salvation on, our lives should be a life that exemplifies I'm alive. I'm alive. I'm alive. But you know what happens? We let little things come into our helmet. We let small things creep in. We let stuff like doubt come in. Makes our helmet a little not snug. We make, let condemnation come in under there. And so we think that God is a big bad wolf trying to get us for what we've done wrong. We let, uh, we let the guilt come in about what we've done or what we've said and our salvation becomes shaky. Whoo-wee. We let our health, since we're not healthy, Come in. Come on, y'all. And then we start doubting the power of God to heal us. We let what we said, what we've done, what we've experienced come under that helmet. And before you know it, we don't know if we're coming, if we're going. We don't know if we're saved, if we're not saved. We don't know if we're on the side of God, if we're not on the side of God. Because we keep letting the helmet of salvation be compromised. I came to talk to your head today. Too many Christians are emotional. I feel saved. I don't know what feeling saved feels like. I don't. Either you are saved and you know it, or you're not and you know it. If you're saved, I want you to stand up. Amen. No, no, clap, clap for real, though, because salvation is important. Amen. All right, you can sit down now. Okay. Now I'm talking to you real, 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 for real now. You need to be firm in your salvation. You need to not be blown by every situation, by every circumstance, by every conversation, by everything that people post on Facebook, you need to be solid in your salvation. When you are solid and equipped and you have the salvation helmet over you, you know that nothing that the enemy tries to throw at you will be of effect. You know that? He's trying to throw stuff at you all the time. But if you have your salvation, he doesn't say put salvation on your shoes, on your feet. He says salvation on your head. Because the battle is won or lost in your head. So you get shaken up by a sickness. You you get shaken up by by a lost loved one. Come on, y'all. You think life is throwing you a curveball. God is punishing you because somebody that you love dies. 
we all going to die. <laughs> and all of us that stood up going to heaven. So what you crying about? This light affliction is just for a moment, but it's working something in your favor. Even if it looks like it's bad, it's working out for you. God understood that you needed this to get to that. So in between here and there, put on your helmet of salvation so that when you go into the world and the world treats you wrong, you're still safe and you're not shook up about it. You don't have to look back and forth and say, what's going on here? You say, I'm stepping with God this step and that step. He has me no matter what. I have the helmet of salvation on, so I'm balanced through it all. All the time we want to say life is tricking me. Life is messing me up. Life is throwing me curveball. No, it's not. Life is doing what life does. But if you're saved and your helmet is secure, you look at life for what it is. It's just life being life. But it's temporary. Amen. So why am I so focused on the temporary? When God came to secure my eternal, why am I so caught up with the busyness of temporary? Because I don't have the helmet of salvation on. I'm not protecting what's inside of there. Amen? Amen? I just want to teach today, y'all. I just want to teach today. Is that all right? Yeah. Rem Q, is that okay if I teach today? Okay. So listen to this. Salvation isn't do this, do that, don't do this, or don't do that. But salvation itself is accept and receive. It's a pure gift. Is not earned by any manner, by any deeds, not preserved by actions, or defended by works. Salvation is a gift. And you and I need to get our mind right about that. In life, there's going to be junk. Salvation doesn't give us a pass from the negative things occurring. However, salvation gives us peace and reassurance during the very absolute worst that life hands us. And when we're going through the worst storms of life, we can say, peace, be still. And expect that God is going to bring us through. Amen. Amen? Amen? But too many times we get caught up in the storm. We get caught up focusing on what the storm is. We get caught up in, in what the sickness, what the disease. I don't have money. I lost a job. My boyfriend left me. My boot and quit me. You know, we get, we get caught up. I can't live without her. She was my soulmate. Now she's somebody else's soulmate. <laughs> come on, I'm, I'm, come on, y'all. Pop said, leave that alone. <laughs> but I'm just trying to say, too, too many times we build, we build our mansions. On sandy ground. We build our, our dreams with no foundation. We build our happily ever after with nothing sure beneath it. And instead of putting on this helmet of salvation and walking in that, we look at things from moment to moment, church. We look at things from situation to situation, and we judge if God is for us or if God is against us by what we're going through. The word says he will never leave us nor forsake us. It's the devil that's against us. It's God that's for us. Amen? So I, I'm going to ask you a couple questions, this one question real quick. Are you saved? I didn't ask you if you're sick. I didn't ask you if you're perfect. I didn't ask you if you're rich. I didn't ask you, ask you if your wife is perfect. I didn't ask you if you're struggling. I didn't ask you if, if you feel saved. I didn't ask you if your wife, if your husband is perfect. I didn't ask you if your kids are perfect. I didn't ask you if you have it all together. I didn't ask you if everything is going to your way. I didn't ask you, do you not commit sin anymore? I asked you, are you saved? Amen. Are you saved? Amen. And as the body, as we go through life, 
as we go through life, we need to be assured of our salvation. We need to be rock solid with our salvation. And I tell people this quite frequently. There is nothing, absolutely nothing, more important than salvation. Not wealth, not fame, not influence, not power, not a, not a 250 IQ, not three Bentleys, not two houses on a hill, not, not Warren Buffett's money. There's nothing more important than salvation. And we keep on chasing after things instead of resting in our salvation. We keep being busy about the things that we think life is supposed to give us instead of being content in the state of salvation. We keep trying to strive for something that, that, thinks, that we think is going to give us a, a, a hand up or give us prestige or something instead of just glowing and basking in the serenity that our salvation guarantees us. We keep getting caught up in the busyness of life and we keep missing the blessing of the surety of salvation. We keep moving too much and missing too much because salvation is the sweetest thing there is. And we become disenchanted and discontent because we don't recognize the wealth that salvation is trying to give us. Are you saved? Salvation itself is our biggest, most powerful weapon of our warfare. You guys get that? I am saved. It's your biggest and best, most powerful response to anything. And what happens to us is we have these default mechanisms and we have these triggers, right? Something happens to me, I'm going to get mad. Something happens to me, I'm going to go into depression. Something happens to me, I'm going to become afraid. Something happens to me, I'm going to be guilty. Something happens to me, I'm going to be condemned. Something happens to me, I'm going to fall into my addiction. Something happens to me, I'm going into my old habits. Something happens to me, I'm going into my, my negative speech. And something happens to me, I go into the whole realm of the negative expectations. Because that's what we default to. And the reason why we default to those things is because we don't have our helmet of salvation on. You know, instead of letting the things trigger you, instead of letting the things trigger you, you know what you should say every time something happens? I'm saved. Sometimes a negative thing happens. Instead of going and doing something crazy, rest and say, I'm saved. Something crazy comes or something happens or something don't go your way, I'm saved. Somebody says something to you, they cut you off in the road. You know when they cut you off in the road? I got cut off this week and I was mad. And I was like, man, I got to, hey, pastor, pull it back, pastor. I had to talk to myself like that. I had to call myself pastor. I usually don't do that. But I call myself pastor. Because <laughs> I'm like, man, this person, they, they just, and I'm like, what do I tell the church? I tell the church. The people that cut you off really probably don't want to wreck. They probably just didn't see you. I'm like, but she had to see me. <laughs> and then I get up there, I'm like, what am I going to do? Got to give her the mean face, right? You know what you got to do, right? You can't, you can't do other stuff, guys. You really can't. So I'm thinking, am I going to give her the mean face or what? Am I going to thank God that nothing happened? Come on, y'all. If I have my helmet of salvation on, then I rejoice because nobody wrecked. I rejoice because we didn't get into a wreck and, and, and I didn't have to say it's your fault, it's my fault or get a leg broken, one of us get killed. I should have rejoiced that the angels of God protected us, that nothing happened. I had my helmet of salvation on so I decided I'm going to go on where I'm going, she's going where she's going and bless God that nothing happened in between. But see, we have these triggers and we default to these things because we have these triggers that are in us. And they're under our helmet of salvation. So something happens and I default to what I've always done. Instead of thinking about that, I got spanked so I wouldn't act like that. So I could get to the blessings of what's over here. Do I want the blessings 
or do I want to stay stuck? I got to keep my salvation helmet on, security at all times. Amen? Because when you do that, you're missing a blessing that's right around the corner. When we want to take time to cut somebody out, come on, y'all, I'm telling the truth. I didn't say I cussed her out. I didn't cuss her out. I'm just saying, when we think about that, when we want to go do something like that, we're missing the opportunity of the blessing that brings us. Now I get to come and tell the church that I preached to myself. Now I get to tell you that I succeeded. Now I get to tell you I just wasn't preaching to you and you're supposed to do right and I'm going to do wrong. I told you that I had my salvation helmet on so that I did not react. I did not take a trigger. I did not get mad. I did not get upset. I didn't go blow my horn at her. I didn't give her the bad finger. I didn't do those things that an old Tony could have done easily that he doesn't do anymore because my salvation helmet is on. I thought about how good God is. I thought about how wonderful he is. I thought about how protected I was. I thought about how great it was that he wanted me well and not wrecked up. I thought about the blessings instead of the moment. Instead of the moment, too many of us want to satisfy our emotions at the moment. I'm mad, so I want to beat you up. Come on, y'all. I'm mad, so I want to tell you off. I'm upset, so I want to have something to say to somebody. (laughs) Amen, I'm talking to your head today, y'all. I'm talking about the helmet of salvation. That when those things come, instead of being triggered and pulled back, because you pull back into fear, guilt, and to depression, and to anger, and then here you are, back here. And then you knew you blew it. And how many times do we really want to say, I'm sorry, versus just getting it right? When we don't have that helmet protecting our heads, those things come in, and they start having a party. And a party is not fun because when that stuff leaves us, we feel terrible. When it's over, we feel like we've been used. When we finally get back to our rest, we knew that we wasted time and that we were taken advantage of. So let's snugly put on our helmet of salvation and protect what's under the helmet. Amen? Amen? These things are sensual, physical victories or defeats, all of which are temporary, such as life is itself, temporary. So I'm wondering how many of us in this room keep fighting battles that we've been fighting since we were young. We keep having the same opponents, maybe face us, and the person has a different face, but it's the same fight. The person didn't know me from the other workplace, but it's the the same fight. The other person didn't know me in this old apartment, other apartment complex, but it's the same fight. How many of us are still fighting the same fight? Let me give you a secret. The reason why you're fighting the same fight is because you're dealing with the same you. You're not dealing with that person who acts like that other person, who acts like that other person, who made you feel like that other person. You're fighting with the person that is you, who has not corrected themselves yet. So therefore, everything that presents itself looks like that same old person that you've been fighting with the whole time, and you forgot that the opponent that you're fighting with is right here. So why is it everywhere that you go, you have the same type of arguments? Because you're taking the same old you everywhere you go. (laughs) Amen? Hey, and I see y'all out there, some of y'all start folding your arms on me real good. (laughs) And you're thinking, oh, it's the devil. No, no. 
We already talked about that. That's not the devil. You said you saved. No, that's not the devil. You have more power than he does. That's not the devil. Remember, as Job, he can only go so far. That's not the devil. You got to take it for what it's worth. And you got to secure your salvation. Amen. Let me tell you some words that salvation means, and I'm going to let you go. Salvation means deliverance. Amen. If you're really saved, then you're really delivered. Amen? Amen. Salvation means welfare. It means your well-being, that you have well-being. You really have well-being. Come on. Salvation means prosperity. That means that you are prosperous because you're saved. Salvation means preservation. That means that you're preserved because you're saved. Amen? Salvation means safety. Because you're saved, and you're safe if you're saved. Amen? Amen? It means to rescue. Salvation means God's rescue, which, de- which delivers believers out of destruction into his safety. Amen? Amen? It means deliverance from sin and its consequences. If I'm saved, sin has no consequences. But that salvation is brought about by faith in Jesus Christ. Salvation means redemption. You have been redeemed. See, something cannot be redeemed unless it's been lost, unless it's been stolen, which actually we were stolen in the Garden of Eden. Mankind was stolen from God. So God went back and redeemed it with the ransom of Jesus Christ. We were stolen. We were kidnapped. We were hijacked. And God redeemed us. Amen? Salvation means reclamation. That means he went and reclaimed us. You know what I'm talking about, Reverend Q? He said, that's still my son. Amen? Salvation means deliverance from harm, ruin, or loss. Salvation means a lifeline. Y'all know that? Salvation means a source of being saved from the harm or ruin of loss. Now, this is it. Soteriology is the doctrine of salvation. And it says this must be the grandest theme in scriptures. It embraces all of the time as well as eternity, past and future. It relates in one way or another to all of mankind without exception. It says salvation is a preeminent thing and nothing is more important than salvation. Amen. 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 Now, we're talking about salvation. I'm about to close this down, but y'all, 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 y'all stand up with me, please. 